Welcome back. Well, what you see before me is a portion of the Black Rose Hall, and we're not getting through this in one video. This is going to turn into the epic saga of the Black Rose trip. So, buckle your seatbelts. We are in for a long, long, long ride, but I promise I'm not going to do it all in one video. We'll see you in a minute. Now that we are back, the first thing I want to do is show you the t-shirts again because we have one more week. I believe at this point we are down to seven or eight days and the campaign ends. The shirts are gone. So we're going to take a quick look at them and then we're going to come back to the black robes. <laughs> following over on the crazy lamp lady this is I, i'm sure i can get it all in here there we go you can write a dissertation on the back of this receipt 287 dollars and nine cents now to be fair a nice chunk of that was wrapped up in some rose medallion saucers that i got for me staying with me they were not a bargain but i wanted them so i'm not sorry i did it i'm really not but jocelyn wasn't kidding when she was just ribbing me saying hey you know i'm going to find these at goodwill next you know next week for five dollars yes but it's okay because i wanted them and every now and then you know you'll end up paying a fair retail price for something just because you wanted it. And by the way, that was probably the low end of full retail, what I paid for those plates. They are not here on the table. They are packed away very, very safely. I will bring them out when we are finishing this up so that you can see them. But as I say, they are not going anywhere. They stay with me. So let's get started on this. Um, we're going to start over here so we can start moving things as we go along. These are in no random order, and I'm not going to be able to give you prices on each individual piece. Um, but um, the most expensive piece, aside from the rose medallion, was uh, $6. I'll show you that piece when we get to it. But here are samplings of the prices. 80 cents, a dollar twenty, a dollar fifty-six, a dollar, a dollar, three sixteen, two thirty-nine, a dollar, a dollar fifty, um, eighty cents, two fifty, four dollars, thirty cents, fifty cents, forty cents. These were definitely goodwill prices. As I said, the most expensive single item was six dollars and when you see it you'll understand why so the average price was two dollars and 26 cents and because receipts at stores like black rose are just they run it off 
with whatever the seller decided to call the piece. And I have a whole bunch of Japanese salt and pepper shakers. So I can go through Japanese salt and pepper shaker again and again and again and never be able to accurately match the price because they take the tags off and that's it. We're going to start with this piece. This is a Japanese, um, it's sort of a little candy dish. Uh, the size I usually see is this size. This was not part of the Black Rose Hall. This just came out of my tidbit tray plate stash because that's what's going to happen to these. This is going to become a leaf tidbit tray. I'll have the two Japanese floral pieces together, and they are just going to make a cute little tidbit tray. And that's why I got that larger piece. I also got a smaller one. Now, it's unfortunate that you're not going to be able to see this, but when I, I, and I will take pictures of all of these. Take a close look at this. This is a beautiful mid-century atomic design. Very mid-century, very sort of George Jetson. Fantastic. This is also destined to be part of a tidbit tray. Probably with this, this is a little mid-century creamer and it has the same leaf. Now this was not part of the Black Rose Hall, but I will photograph these together so you can see why I think I might put them together on a tidbit tray. Uh, whatever I do with this, I'm going to make sure that we don't do anything to undercut the mid-century design. And as a consequence, the other plate or plates in that tidbit tray are probably going to be very simple. Um, nothing elaborate, nothing to take away from that, because that is a really charming little piece. I'm glad I've got it. This is one of the rare pieces where they didn't peel the sticker off. This is a set of four. I've got four of them. I'm mean, just holding one of them up now. Nice gold trimming. Um, I'm not sure what that's called when it's a china pattern. It's called carnation when it's on glassware. It's got that yellow band. It's unmarked. But that yellow band makes me think it's Japanese because that was something that is characteristic of early 20th century Japanese China that you just don't see other places. Not to say that it couldn't exist on a piece of French China, but I would say my guess is Japanese. My first thought when grabbing these pieces obviously was, oh, tidbit tray, not anymore. I've had a chance to look at them. These are going to get sold as is. They are very, very nice little dessert bowls. And it's a set of four. And they're beautiful. So they're going to go out kind of as is. Somebody's going to be happy to get them. Now let's take a look at these. When we were going into uh, Black Rose, this was one of the first things I came across, and we have three of them here. These oversized shakers, flour, pepper, and sugar. And they are magnificent. The sugar in particular is beautifully crazed, and it's actually discolored. These sat on an old stove top for many, many years. There's, there is something so charming about that that you can look at it and you can actually see. Uh, you can see the life of the piece. Um, I have to check my cork box. I have a feeling with all the salt and pepper shakers I've picked up, I'm going to need more corks. But these are going to have to be very large. I've already had inquiries on this set. I think they are utterly terrific. They're going to have to be cleaned up. They are going out as a set. I'm not going to try to break them up, but they're beautiful pieces. Did I mention they were Japanese? They are. They, they are marked Japanese. Um, gorgeous pieces. Massive corks. The size of that hole. I could stick my thumb in there. 
Um, beautiful, beautiful pieces. They will be, as I said, going out as a set. I love the fact that they have this wonderful, shabby, antique country look to them. That's something that I really appreciate when I see it. It's not really my own style. But, geez, I just drool over it when I come across it. This. This is a picture. Japanese. It, uh, it has the remains of a mark that really can't be read, but there's, there's no doubt in my mind that this was a Japanese picture, probably from around the mid-century, 1930s to 1950s, I'm thinking. Beautiful piece. I took a look at pictures specifically because one of the frequent buyers at my Etsy shop had mentioned that she was looking for pictures like this to sort of nestle in among her flowers so that she didn't have to go dragging watering cans across the house to get everything watered. Really good idea. So I saw a few pictures. Now I would have gotten them anyway, but I have to say the fact that this could easily make one of my frequent buyers very happy always helps. And remember this, if you're selling online and you have people who are visiting your shop or your listings over and over again, if they end up asking you for something, keep your eyes open for it. For one thing, it's a sure sale once you get to know their taste. But most importantly, what does it hurt you to do something for somebody who's bringing you business all the time. It doesn't, you know. So take care of your customers. This is a darling piece. Um, part of me is hoping she doesn't like it because I wouldn't mind keeping it myself. No, that's really not fair. I'm running out of pretty boxes. This is another piece, another Japanese picture. And interestingly enough, about, I guess, six weeks ago, uh, Jocelyn and I were, I believe, at Black Rose, where I picked up another piece, just like this one. Now, this one is dirty. It needs to be cleaned up. But this one is lusterware. And the interesting thing about this is it has this pretty peach lusterware band, but it doesn't go all the way around. It sort of terminates in this little flourish here, which is one of the things I thought was very interesting. Um, nice floral garden design and personally I think that's eminently suitable to serving as a little houseplant watering container. And then I grabbed this picture. This picture is utterly stunning. These two are, are similar in that they are a more more subtle design. This is just, this was an intended to be a statement piece. It's lusterware. It's got the beautiful peach lusterware rim, heavily gilded, heavy moriage. It is Japanese and marked. Now here's the interesting thing about that. Very different on the back side. So I guess you have your choice which side you want to show. But this one is what they would call the money side. A beautiful, beautiful, stunning piece of just, this is great Japanese work. This was my $6 piece. And believe me, even though it was one of the most expensive things I bought that day, I would buy this for $6 all day long. That's a beautiful piece and well worth it. So, another Japanese piece. This is not marked. There's no question that it's Japanese. Um, looks like it's, it's orange irises. Very pretty. Uh, it's a powder box, basically. I imagine today it would be used as a trinket box, but in the old days when everybody used dusting powder, that's probably what a piece like this would have been used for. Uh, very pretty piece. 
Um, unfortunately, I have no idea what I paid for it. I know it wasn't very much because I read the prices off to you. Really sweet piece. This is, along with this, these are both relatively modern Japanese pieces. They are not particularly old, so there's no real um, strong antique or vintage value to them. They're probably vintage, to be sure, but not from the 30s or 40s, not quite that vintage. This one, beautiful design around it. This is just a great piece. So, now let's take a look at some salt and pepper shakers. I wanted you to see this one for two reasons. Let me take this off. There is a price tag on the bottom of this right here. It says 50 cents. Um, Lefter, Lefter Brothers, 50 cents. So that was the original retailer. Of course, it's marked Japan. Um, and that's the little tray. These don't have corks. You screw the tops on and off. That top works just fine. This one does not. The threads have gotten a little worn. So, you're probably thinking, oh, we've got a problem. Well, we've also got a fast and easy solution. When I get this cleaned up, obviously I wouldn't do it now because there's a lot of grime here. I will twist plumber's tape around the threads of this opening. And then I will just twist this on and it will fit just fine. Now plumber's tape, if you're not familiar with it, actually looks like surgical adhesive tape. It comes in one of those little spool type rolls like adhesive tape and it's white but it's a thin um, very thin vinyl material and actually it might be silicone I don't know the chemical composition of it when you wrap it around the threads you always wrap in the direction that you would screw so I'm screwing this on clockwise which means I'll wrap the threads clockwise and that little plastic will get right in here and it will mold itself around these threads. Uh, plumber's tape is great. If you have a garden hose that leaks whenever you hook it to the, the little hose bib, <coughs> you know, and it's just leaking for no other reason than that it just doesn't fit quite as tightly as it ought to, you wrap the hose bib in plumber's tape, try it again, you'll be surprised what a good fit you'll get. Um, I keep plumber's tape in my doll, in my doll room, because I have used plumber's tape to fix all kinds of doll problems. It is removable, it does no permanent damage to anything, and it can tighten up loose joints. It's really, it's great stuff. All right, so... That was interesting, but these, um, the other thing I wanted to show you, which is why I wouldn't pass these up, even though what you cannot see from where you are, but you will see when I show you the picture, because I'm going to take a close-up, is that little floral design is actually um, like pixels. These are uh, an incredibly Art Deco little design. These little pixelated flowers. Very, very interesting. That alone would have convinced me to buy them. Not to mention the fact that I think they were the 40 cent piece I got. They were very, very inexpensive. Definitely a bargain. These are also Japanese. It's, um, what is it? Relco. 
we've talked about this before, there were a number of companies that were importing from Japan in the mid-century, and they're all different names. Uh, we talked about Lefton, uh, New Orleans, Yukago, this is Relco, and they usually identified their products with little metallic stickers on the bottom. And both of these have their little stickers. Lusterware salt and pepper shaker with like little beads glued on. I've always considered that to be sort of the poor man's moriage because I've seen these little glittery beads glued on to pieces in the mid-century in much the same way as the moriage work was applied to earlier pieces. So this is all raised here. Very interesting, very pretty. Um, let me get them so they're apparently that's how they work. Um, very mid-century lines. Great little pieces. Oh, and speaking of great little pieces, the Orphaned Salt Shaker. I got this for under a dollar. It was probably 50 or 60 cents. It is a lusterware salt shaker. Very unusual shape. These planes are all triangular. I try to move it so you can see if I can get the light to hit it. It's just triangles on triangles. Very Art Deco, beautiful piece, not likely to be offered for sale because it's just, it's a single shaker. In all likelihood, that is going to end up getting its cork pulled out of it and end up on the top of a tidbit tray. Wouldn't that be smashing? It really would. But for now, that's going into my little box. Uh, it was just too beautiful to pass up, even though there was only one of them. Um, this, by the way, is another orphaned salt shaker. Beautiful condition. Apparently, it was orphaned long ago, and nobody ever bothered to use it. Um, beautiful lusterware gilding. Just one. And again, it may well find its way onto the top of a tidbit tray. You never know. Now, let's take a look at these. Once again, we're back to pay attention to your customers. This is a teapot and sugar bowl combination salt and pepper shaker. Uh, obviously, the teapot, the blue one, is the salt. For some reason, they associated salt with blue and pepper with brown. I get the pepper with brown part. But the salt was blue, I'm just not clear about. And I recently sold a set of coffee pot, teapot, salt shakers, salt pepper shakers, to a buyer who said that's specifically what she collects. So when I get these ready for sale, I'm going to send her a note and let her know she needs to check back at my eBay store because this could very well be something that she would like to add to her collection. And I have no problem with that at all. I like repeat buyers. Now, as we are starting to get tight on time, and because I'm not going to go over, we're, we're going to do what we can do, then we're going to stop, and we're going to pick it up later. I want to show you this. This is uh, a hair receiver, Nippon. This is just gorgeous, gorgeous Japanese porcelain. And what would happen is people would stick hair in it, and then they would pull the hair out, and they would make things out of it. Morning jewelry, very often, you know, you get the hair of a dead person. I know it sounds creepy, but in the 21st century, when we have all kinds of keepsakes and reminders and so on of our loved ones, keeping their hair seems very foolish, but 100, 200 years ago, when oftentimes people never even had a photograph taken in the person's lifetime, and then when they died, they would have them photographed, but that's a whole other story. 
saving hair was a big deal. And I've talked to you about this before. This earring originally had a little sort of bag on it made of a dead person's hair. So when I got the earrings, the first thing I did was I took them gingerly to a jeweler and said, get rid of that dead person's hair and just stick a pearl in there. Because no disrespect to the dead person, but I do not want dead people's hair in my ears. And if I do, I at least like to know who the dead person was. And this was a dead stranger. So, uh, yeah, so that, that hair thing was really common. This is beautiful. It's got a little bird on it. It's got uh, the moriage. No gilding. No, no gilding, which is unusual for an upon piece like this. So what do we do with this? You know, we're not putting hair in it anymore. Before we started, I grabbed this from the living room. This is a little ten-sided amber bowl. This is its little lid. The lid is uh, celluloid, and the stuff that is in here, I don't know if you can see, are little fragrance beads. Smells very nice. It lives in my living room. Uh, it's a very attractive piece. It shouldn't live in my living room. It should really live in my bedroom. Um, the colors go better in my bedroom, but I didn't have anything especially pretty to keep the beads in for the living room, so that's how that happened. And I can indeed trust the photobomb kitty not to knock things over. He's really quite good about that. So I can leave it safely on a table. All right. So before we close this off, one more little thing I want to show you. This was very inexpensive. I think it was like a dollar. It's a little figurine of two puppies. And the tip of one puppy's tail is gone. And I'm going to take a look at whether or not I can actually refabricate that little tail end. Or if what I want to do is just go in with my Dremel and smooth it off. Got a little hole in it. So you know what this is going to become. This is going to sit on top of a tidbit tray. Two little puppies. And... Fortunately, because this is a peach and white luster wear, it's going to go very nicely with most of the luster wear that I have. So that'll go on a tidbit tray. All right, so we're going to break off here. I'm going to get you pictures of all of this stuff so that you can take a look. And because I know we're going through this quickly, you're not really getting a chance to take much of a look at it. And I do want you to see it because the reason I am buying these things is they will sell. Um, they, they literally fly off the shelves of my Etsy. Well, no, they don't literally because my Etsy store doesn't have shelves. They go out as soon as I can list them. Um, these things are popular. This is what people want. This is what they are buying. So that's why I want you to see this. And also because you saw the prices I'm paying for. And there's almost no way you can avoid making a profit on something you pay 80 cents for that you know people are going to want. So that's why I want you to see this. All right. Have a great week. I will see you next Saturday, regular informational video at that point. We're going to do a how-to on Sunday. And then on Monday, hopefully, we'll pick up with some more of this. Um, we've got a long way to go. And I, I, I will be listing like crazy in my Etsy shop because I'm running out of room here. All right, so I will see you next week.